The Curriculum, Part 1, Ends and Processes The Curriculum, Chapter 1, Two Levels of Educational Experience Current discussion of education reveals the presence in the field of two antagonistic schools of educational thought. On the one hand are those who look primarily to the subjective results, the enriched mind, quickened appreciations, refined sensibilities, disciplined culture, to them, the end of education is the ability to live, rather than the practical ability to produce. For them, most of education is to be motivated by interest in the educational experiences themselves, without particular solicitude at the moment as to the practical use or uselessness of those experiences. If they expand and unfold the potential nature of the individual, therein lies their justification. The full unfoldment of one's powers is the primordial preparation for practical life. On the other hand, there are those who hold that education is to look primarily and consciously to efficient practical action in a practical world. The individual is educated who can perform efficiently the labors of his calling, who can effectively cooperate with his fellows in social and civic affairs, who can keep his bodily powers at a high level of efficiency, who is prepared to participate in proper range of desirable leisure occupations, who can effectively bring his children to full-orbed manhood and womanhood, and who can carry on all his social relations with his fellows in an agreeable and effective manner. Education is consciously tr to prepare for these things. The controversy involves practically every field of training. For example, the advocates of culture would have science studied because it is a rich and vitalizing field of human thought. They would have the student live abundantly within the wide fields of his chemistry or biology or physics, without at the time any great regard for the practical use or uselessness of the particular facts met with. If the experience is vivifying, if it satisfies intellectual cravings, therein is to be found its sufficient excuse. They assume that enough of the scientific fact principles and habits of mind acquired will be of use afterwards to justify the teaching from a purely utilitarian point of view. In fact, they assert that these things can be better mastered when studied as science for science sake than when narrowed down to practical science for the world for the works sake. The utilitarians, on the other hand, would have science studied in order that the facts may be put to work by farmers in their farming by mechanics in their shops, and variously in the fields of manufacturing, mining, cooking, sanitation, etc. They would have an accurate survey made of the science needs of each social class, and to each they would teach only the facts needed, only those that are to be put to work. In an age of efficiency and economy, they would seek definitely to eliminate the useless and the wasteful, to cover the broad fields of the sciences without regard to the functioning value of the particular facts is a blunderbuss method in an age that demands the accuracy of the rifle. It is to waste time and energy and money that are needed elsewhere. It is to force upon unwilling students things that can be justified upon no practical grounds. A social study like history or literature, the culture advocates conceive to be chiefly a means of lifting the curtain upon human experience in all lands and ages. It gives the pupil an opportunity to view and to mingle vicariously in the age-long varied pageant of worldwide human life. The pupil's business is simply to look upon this pageant as he would view a play at, a, at the theater. The experience is in itself a satisfying mode of living, enriching his consciousness, expanding the fields of his imagination, refining his appreciations. When in his reading he beholds the glory that was Greece and the splendor that was Rome, the epics of Homer or the dramas of Shakespeare, he need not concern himself with the application of that experience in the performance of his practical duties. On the other hand, the utilitarians tell us that we would better eliminate ancient history and the older literatures. These deal with a world that is dead, a civilization that is moldered with governments that are now obsolete with manners and customs and languages that are altogether impracticable in this modern age. In their judgment, insofar as we need history at all, it should be modern history drawn for the purpose of throwing light upon current 
practical problems of industry, commerce, and citizenship. The facts should be gathered in definite relation to the problems and not be mere blunderbuss history that aims at nothing in particular. And as for literature, they say, it would best be that which reveals the world of today, the present natures of men and women, present-day social problems and human reactions, current modes of thought, existing conditions in the fields of commerce, industry, sanitation, civic relationships, and recreational life. Not classics, but current literature. The controversy is particularly marked in the matter of foreign languages. Ancient languages do not function in the lives of men, say the utilitarians, therefore they should be cast out. For the vast majority, even the modern languages do not function. What does not appear in the lives of the people has no reason to appear in the education of the people. The argument is plausible, convincing, and yet the foreign language advocate is not convinced. He asserts that important matters are lost sight of, that there are more things in human life than practical action, however efficient, that living itself is worthwhile, that is the end of education, and that the various utilities are but to provide the means. He looks to a self-realization, to a humanism, to a world of satisfactions that lie above and beyond the mere means to be used in attaining those high ends. He accuses our practical age of aiming at a life for man that is too narrow, barren, mechanical, materialistic. Now which side is right? Doubtless both are right. It is like asking the question, which shall the tree produce, the flower or the fruit? It must produce both, or it will not perform its full function. We have here simply to do with two levels of functioning, two levels of educational experiences, both of which are essential to fullness of growth, efficiency of action, and completeness of character. Both are good, both are necessary. One precedes the other. One is experience upon the play level, the other experience upon the work level. One is action driven by spontaneous interest, the other by derived interest. One is the luxuriation of the subjective life, which has a value for objective experience, even though one be not conscious of the values of the time. The other looks to the conscious shaping and control of the objective world, but requires for maximum, f maximum effectiveness the background of subjective life provided by the other. The culture people are not wrong in demanding an education that looks to the widening of vision, the deepening of the general understanding, the actualizing of one's potential powers, the full-orbed expansion and maintenance of the personality, the harnessing up of native interests, the development of enthusiasms and ideals, or briefly, the full humanization of the individual. They cannot too much insist. The practical-minded people are not wrong in affirming that man's life consists and must consist largely in the performance of responsible duties, that these are to be capably performed, that responsibilities are to be efficiently absolved, that there is need of technical accuracy, dependableness, industry, persistence, right habits, skill, practical knowledge, physical and moral fiber, and adherence to duty, whether it be pleasant or painful, and that these results are not to be sufficiently achieved without education of the practical work type. Upon these things they cannot too much insist. End of chapter 1